The rules are that there's a 10 minute presentation from each of them, which has been written out, so they're going to have to read it because they've shown it to each other. Then there's a three minute rebuttal in reverse order or the same order, Rick? Re reverse order probably then in that case. No, it can't be, it has to be the, the original order, doesn't it? Okay, then you have, <laughs> then you have, inter I mean, see I'm getting confused already. <laughs> but I'll be corrected by somebody. Um, Rick has done this before, I haven't, so. Um, then there will be a lot of interaction, as much as you like, speaking, making points, or asking questions. And then at the end there will be another vote. And the winner, the winning team, as it were, think of all those people behind, the people put on the oil and so on, you know, they're all there. Um, the winning team, the winning thesis, the winning proposal will be announced because you all have a chance of voting again. So you'll vote again and then we'll see which arguments have swayed you. So I think you should go up to the podium. Podium, you see a Latin, Latin thing. <laughs> and timing starts from now. Now? Is, is somebody actually running a timer? Yes, I am. Okay. <laughs> Have you started it? Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to have any unfair advantage here. No, no, I know you were making it. The resolution before us is that wherever possible, library collections should be shaped by patrons rather than by librarians. Not every library is in a position to undertake a patron-driven acquisition program, and of course not every book published is available for purchase under a patron-driven acquisition program. There are situations in which, for a variety of reasons, it may not be possible to undertake a patron-driven program. So to be very clear, supporting the present resolution does not mean saying that librarians should never select books for library collections. <laughs> Wherever politically and structurally possible, however, I believe it is better for the, li for the collection to be shaped by patrons than by librarians, and I therefore speak in favor of the resolution. In this, as with most other issues, we need to distinguish between means and ends. The things we do in libraries are the means, and the things we hope to accomplish by doing them are the ends. In libraries, where we've done the same things for a very long time, and in many cases gotten very good at doing them, there's always the risk of getting means and ends confused, of coming to believe, for example, that the purpose of the catalog is to, pr is to present perfect information about our collections, or that the purpose of interlibrary loan is to share, or that the purpose of the collection is to be comprehensive and balanced and coherent. There's a wonderful children's book that some of you may have seen called A Hole is to Dig, it was written by Ruth Krauss in 1952, and it compiles responses from small children to questions like, what is a hole and what are eyebrows? The answers are sweet and hilarious and tend to follow a common circular pattern. A hole is to dig. A face is so you can make faces. A castle is to build in the sand. And my favorite, grass is to have on the ground with dirt under it and clover in it. <laughs> the phrase, a hole is to dig, comes to my mind frequently when thinking about and discussing collection development. Too often, I think, we succumb to the temptation to believe that a collection is to collect, that it justifies itself by being a collection and by being good. So when it comes to collections, what are the means and what are the ends? To put it more simply, why do academic libraries have collections? I would argue that the ultimate purpose of the collection is very simple. It's to give students and faculty access to the documents they need in order to do their scholarly work. Its purpose is not to showcase the erudition and wisdom of librarians, nor is it to ensure the library a high ranking among its peers, nor is its purpose even to represent a coherent and comprehensive monument to human knowledge. The collection may in fact do all these things, but its size and coherence, its organization, and its comprehensiveness are all means to an end, not ends in themselves. Scholarship is the end. An academic library collection is better or worse to the exact degree that it makes the scholarly work of its stakeholders possible. This fact makes patron-driven acquisition, which is to say the building of collections in response to real-world scholarly needs as expressed in the real-world use of books a fundamentally superior approach to, collect to collection building than an approach by which third parties, librarians, attempt at great expense and very often erroneously to guess and anticipate what books their patrons will need in order to do that work. 
I've heard or can anticipate a number of different objections to this position, and I'll try to answer five of them preemptively. The first is about relevance over time. An academic library serves more than just the students and faculty who are present at the moment. It also serves those who will come in the future. For this reason, letting its collection be shaped by the immediate needs of today's patrons is short-sighted. My answer to this objection is to point out the absurdity of trying to anticipate future needs. And if anyone here thinks absurdity is too strong a word, I invite you to walk the stacks of any large academic library and look at the books that were purchased 20, 30, 40, or more years ago. A few of them remain relevant and useful today. A very large percentage of them do not. A few of them are timeless classics. The great majority of them are not. Some are actually embarrassing. Here's the problem. The further you look into the future, the broader becomes the spectrum of possible scholarly needs, and therefore the greater the likelihood that we'll guess incorrectly what our future scholars will actually need. We're kidding ourselves if we think we can guess today which books or other resources scholars of the year 2024, let alone 2064, are going to need. We can do a pretty good job of guessing what will stand the test of time in terms of quality. Predicting what will remain relevant is a roll of the dice and an increasingly expensive one. The second objection is about the quality and relevance of library collections in the long term. Library patrons may know what seems useful to them today, but they don't know what will stand the test of time. This objection is based on the assumption that the purpose of an academic library collection is to act as an enduring monument to scholarship. I think that assumption, while not entirely without merit, is problematic. The primary goal of a library is to make possible the scholarly work of its patrons. A book that will stand the test of time but is not relevant to the needs of today's patrons represents, at the very least, a purchase the appropriateness of which should be questioned given our manifest inability to anticipate what will be relevant to tomorrow's patrons, and given the fact that libraries have no choice but to forego the purchase of high-quality books every day given budget and mission limitations. The third objection is specifically about quality in the here and now. Library patrons may know what they want, but they don't necessarily know what they need. Academic libraries don't exist to please the customer, but to provide access to the best scholarly resources possible. Patron-driven acquisition is the intellectual equivalent of giving your kids Twinkies for breakfast because that's what they think they want. To this objection, I have two responses. The first is that intellectual Twinkies can easily be, and routinely are, excluded from a PDA profile. When setting up PDA pro programs, librarians can, and invariably do, set broad parameters for what will be offered, while still allowing patrons to shape the collection by their scholarly behavior. So the intellectual Twinkies are a red herring. Second response, we librarians have gotten away for far too long with the arrogant stance that we know better than our patrons what they need in order to do their work. In some cases, we may well know better. In others, we don't. And we can't possibly hope to know better than they do consistently across all situations and for all of the thousands of students and faculty we serve. The fourth objection is about the impact of PDA on overall collection quality. Librarian-driven acquisition creates a coherent and, and intelligently crafted collection because it's guided by a conscious program and a team of trained bibliographic professionals. Patron-driven acquisition creates a disjointed and incoherent mishmash of resources that are guided by no overarching program, including the curriculum. In response to this objection, I refer again to the question of the collection's purpose. Does it exist to showcase the skill of the librarians who built it, or to serve the scholarly needs of the students and faculty for whose use it's intended? A collection may be coherently and intelligently crafted and nevertheless fail to meet the needs of its users. The best way to ensure that it will fully support the scholarship taking place on campus is to provide access to as many relevant and high quality documents as possible. In an environment of strictly limited resources, which is the environment in which the vast majority of research libraries Two are operating. Minutes to go. The, in, the ability to offer a very large number of such documents and then acquire only those that are demonstrated to meet real world needs is much more likely to result in a relevant and useful collection than a program of prediction and guesswork. Notably, by offering a far greater number of books than could possibly be purchased preemptively, a PDA program also provides far richer opportunities for serendipitous discovery than traditional collection building programs possibly could. The fifth objection is not philosophical, but practical. Patron-driven acquisition risks letting spending run out of control. This is one of the most obvious concerns about patron-driven acquisition. If you put the patron in the driver's seat and tell him to drive as fast and as far as he wants, how do you keep the gas tank from emptying out before all needs have been met? This concern can be dispatched quite quickly. 
There are many mechanisms available to regulate the rate of spending on PDA from the cordoning off of dedicated and limited budget lines to what's called risk pool management, whereby the number of books offered is decreased as the, money, as the amount of money available shrinks. The bottom line, though, is simply that putting the patron in the driver's seat does not mean giving him the option of driving as fast as he wants for as long as he wants. Mechanisms exist and are easily applied to manage the rate of PDA expenditure. Those who've been paying attention may have noticed a common thread among the objections to patron-driven acquisition that I have laid out here. They tend to be library-centered, indeed collection-centered, rather than patron-centered. Those who oppose PDA or who believe that it should have only a marginal place in our collecting strategies seem to me very often to be motivated by a fear that their work as professional librarians will be moved to the periphery by a system that uses scholarly behavior rather than librarian expertise to shape our collections. This fear is rational and legitimate. It's not, however, a suitable foundation for a collection development strategy. It's not our students or researchers' job to you're, keep you're, us... You're out of time, actually. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, you can finish it off in the rebuttal. Okay. That's fine. Okay, the next champion goes up. He's adjusting his loincloth. He's ready to move. <clears throat> Tell me when you're ready to start. You may start. Point one. I am not against patron-driven selection. PDA can be a cost-effective tool for exposing high-use core materials that librarians would have selected anyway, getting them into collections without the need for selector review. The basic premise of PDA seems almost unassailably logical and democratic. Instead of trying to guess what patrons want, let them choose for themselves and you can't go wrong. Who could argue with this? Okay, I concede from the beginning, PDA is a useful tool. A Phillips head screwdriver is also a useful tool. It allows us to efficiently apply maximal torque and tr uh, rotational pressure to drive a screw into a hard surface with a minimum of force. It's truly a marvelous device, optimal for its task, and we should all be thankful for its invention. How much better the Phillips head screwdriver is than traditional methods of attaching things in the old pre-Phillips days. But should we therefore conclude that Phillips head screwdrivers should be used for all tasks? You could try to use it for cleaning a fish, uh, scraping snow off your windshield, combing your hair, or eating mashed potatoes. But should you? <laughs> By elevating the role of a special purpose tool to a broad collection development principle, giving it the evangelical force of the word should, and promoting a dogma that all libraries ought to seek this path to perfection, the proposition leads us down a garden path that would ultimately deprive the entire research library community of the ability to meet their mission and serve their patrons. Notice critically, I am not arguing that another useful tool, librarian-driven acquisition, should be the universal way all collection shaping takes place. We should deploy the right tool for the right tasks. A flexible toolkit gives us maximum scope for meeting our mission. The proposition is false because it presents patron selection as the approach for collection shaping, a false panacea. Point two, I want to get rid of some myths, false distinctions, caricatures, intentional mischaracterizations, and rhetorical straw men that are raised whenever this topic is discussed. The corollaries of the proposition, which I use to shoot it down, apply equally to the shaping of collections in print and electronic form in libraries with large and small budgets. Contrary to the rhetoric my opponent has deployed before, the argument is not old-fashioned print-based thinking doggedly resisting the forward-looking visionaries of the modern world. Let's unpack the terms of the proposition in detail. Libraries should take those actions that best support their mission of connecting patrons with the content they need. Libraries provide that content to patrons in three ways. We buy it, we license it, and we borrow it. The collection is what we choose to purchase or license. Shaping a collection means choosing what to collect versus borrow. Librarians engage in a balancing act, deploying limited resources strategically for current and future needs. Librarians look at cost-benefit ratios and trade-offs for their patrons every day. Should we license this content or purchase it? Should we get the big deal package or select title by title? Multi-year contract or a year at a time? How many simultaneous users? Get it ourselves or buy it in the consortium? Buy individual articles, subscribe to the journal, or purchase the back file? Maybe don't collect it at all. Maybe we could borrow it for our patrons as needed, and so on. 
In contrast, the life of the patron is amazingly simple. I look at what's available, I pick what I want. The hard questions don't arise for them. Today's proposition is all about who should make these hard collection shaping choices. Should we really take the librarian out of the shaping business altogether? Notice the proposition also uses the hedge wherever possible. It is always possible, though not always advisable, to have all choices made by patrons just as it is possible to eat potatoes with a screwdriver. There already are some libraries following this dictum, eliminating librarians in favor of PDA, and the world has not come to an end yet. Let's take a look at the roles of profit, discovery, availability, and cooperation to see the impact. PDA systems are arranged with vendors and aggregators, supplying sets of records which librarians expose to patrons in a discovery system, which the patrons select by clicking. These systems are optimized for mainstream commercial content, with libraries letting vendors market their wares directly to their patrons. In theory, there's nothing wrong with that. We know lots of mainstream commercial content is precisely what the patrons want anyway, right? So, so far, so good. But what about all the non-commercial, non-core research content, print, digital, and other format, excluded from the mainstream because it is less profitable? Research needs and commercial viability are not always the same thing. Think of data sets, global government documents, NGO publications, think tank reports, gray literature, maps, digital ephemera, print ephemera, all kinds of specialized research material. What if all our libraries simply stopped collecting these because they were not profitable for commercial PDA? I hear you thinking, oh, if these things really mattered, why wouldn't vendors sell them to us in PDA? Doesn't demand drive supply? No. The market can ignore these needs because it's harder to make a profit on them. The cost of acquiring this kind of content may be too high, projected constituency too specialized, demand too low, market too small. Would original research really be possible in a community of libraries that simply gave up the long tail of lower use specialized non-commercial content? Until a few weeks ago, Ebola was a distant obscurity. Now it's, whoa, where the heck did that come from? If Liberian public health documents, in English, mind you, are available to academia at all, it's only because they were collected by research libraries shaping their collections before the outbreak hit the headlines. Trust me, these materials will not make their way into your commercial PDA. They are not commercially viable because vendors thrive on selling as many copies as possible of the same thing. Their profits lie in the duplicate sales at the high use end of the spectrum, ignoring the long tail. Just a few weeks ago, no one had heard of ISIS. Turns out it's a well-equipped army of 30,000 fighters controlling vast areas of Syria and Iraq. Whoa, where the heck did that come from? Content to answer that question also exists, but it's in a squiggly language, highly specialized, not commercially viable, not in the mainstream, and certainly not coming to you via PDA. If we all adopt the proposition wherever possible, this kind of material will be absent, not discoverable, let alone accessible. By the time someone has figured out what's needed on Ebola or ISIS, libraries will be unable to acquire such material. It will no longer be available. The same is true with new trends in academia that require us to strategically shape our collections. So many new fields now adopting quantitative methodologies, student research assignments requiring new types of microdata, financial and social demographic statistics, maps and GIS data, et cetera. New cross-disciplinary global concerns such as energy and environment, entrepreneurship and applied science, climate change and human rights, internationalization across the campus, traditional language and literature departments with new emphases on cultural studies, film, popular culture, mass social movements, and so on. Patron selection alone simply will not get us there. Patrons can only request what they can discover. The largest source of discovery is the aggregate of library catalogs. But here's the catch-22. If libraries only collect what patrons select, the long tail just won't make it in. They can't discover it, they can't request it, and libraries won't acquire it. And then too often it's simply too late, no longer available. A tremendous portion of current use of our collections consists of material no longer in print, not on the web, and, not av and available, if at all, only by borrowing from a library that had the foresight to collect it back when it was available. Collection shaping means being proactive on behalf of your patrons. 
Abdicating responsibility for shaping collections nullifies the cost efficiency of collection sharing. All over the country, library consortia are pushing the envelope for more efficient collection sharing with print and electronic delivery. Optimized shared repositories, integrated shared discovery and request systems, negotiated consortial deals, new kinds of licenses for shared electronic content. Collaboration has enabled us to pursue coordinated collection development. So leveraging our resources as a community, enriching the collective collection, reducing unnecessary duplication, and redeploying resources strategically. But all of this coordination disappears if shaping is done exclusively by patrons. Patrons do not wear the collection development thinking cap. The result is massively duplicated vanilla collections accumulated with no intelligent design other than greatest profits for the vendors and no provision for patron actual needs. I know many of you are thinking, oh, they could do that at Princeton, but how could we afford that? This logic is false. The tighter the money, the more strategic, careful, and collaborative you have to be in deploying it. Your patrons can't do that for you. I'm Giving afraid you'll have to wrap up now. Last okay. sentence. Okay, finish, finish sentence, go. Remember, patron-driven librarians can shape collections. Patrons on no, their own no, That's two sentences, no. <laughs> The gladiator, Mr. Anderson, has asked me to use a timing device because he thinks I'm favoring the other one. <laughs> I am doing that now. Not, not Notice. favoring. Now, ready, steady, go. My worthy opponent has, I believe, successfully refuted the proposition that patron-driven acquisition is the best way to build a collection. That, however, is not the resolution that we're debating here today. To argue in favor of this resolution is not to say that PDA is the best way to build a great collection. It's to say that the greatness of the collection is not the point. The point is to support scholarship. What David has not done, in my view, is demonstrate that librarian-driven collection building is the best way to accomplish that task. In fact, if connecting students and faculty with what they need in order to do their scholarly work is the task, then librarian-driven acquisition is a demonstrably poor tool for it, since it invariably means guesswork and prediction about which resources will actually meet scholarly needs, which is a bit like using a screwdriver to eat mashed potatoes. It involves a huge amount of wasted energy, not to mention wasted money. David's points about profit and, about profit and patrons are not incorrect but neither are they particularly relevant to the resolution we're addressing today. He's right to point out that there are, and surely always will be, documents that patrons need in order to do their scholarly work, but that are not available for acquisition on a PDA basis. If the resolution under debate were, no one except patrons should ever shape library collections, or libraries should only collect materials that are available on a PDA basis, then his point would constitute a powerful refutation of it. But neither of those is the resolution under debate. Clearly, if we need documents that can't be acquired through PDA, then we need to get them in some other way. The fact that PDA will not always be possible is explicitly accounted for in the resolution. Last point, David seems to have confused the idea of patron-driven acquisition with patron selection. The two concepts are very different. PDA doesn't call on patrons to make selections. It provides what patrons experience as a larger collection and than what libraries could possibly provide based on speculative purchasing, and then simply invites the patrons to do their work. The patrons don't make selections, they do their work, and the work they do then generates selections. David is right that books in the long tail of relevance may not make it into the collection by this mechanism. Some will and some won't, but this is true no matter how we buy books. I'm very emotional about that point. <laughs> but this is true no matter how we buy books. Let me close by pointing out a fundamental point on which David and I very much agree. The tighter the money, the more strategic, careful, and collaborative you have to be in deploying it. This is why libraries like mine, a library whose entire operating budget is barely larger than Princeton's annual expenditure on collections, have been relatively enthusiastic about embracing PDA. Buying, housing, and caring for books that our patrons don't need may be a great way to build a wonderful collection, but it's no strategy at all for allocating strictly limited resources in support of the 15 scholarly seconds. work. In support of the scholarly work on our campus, says. Oh. I'm sorry that Gladiator Anderson gave up 14 seconds just then. I, I'm not happy about that. Okay, now I'm going to, um, oh, it's just saying, telling me. Okay, are you ready, Gladiator? There you go. Yeah? Let it okay. roll. 
oh. with, without identifying a single specific good thing about PDA, Rick devotes his statement instead to a new low of dismissive stereotyping <laughs> and character assassination. That's good stuff. A completely fictionalized librarian straw man to shoot down, he trivializes and slanders the work of librarians calling us childish, a collection is to collect. Arrogant and self-centered, monuments to our own wisdom. Absurd and delusional, tilting toward comprehensive collections for a distant future. And wasteful and self-interested, valuing our own jobs over the interests of patrons. This cartoon character villain actually doesn't exist. No library would tolerate it. So let's dispose of these distractions and hot air and look at the real world. We librarians are patron driven, engaged closely with our faculty and students every day. We engage in collection shaping with and on behalf of our patrons because failing to do so produces negative impacts right here and right now, not 40 years into the future. Because of potential bad outcomes from PDA, even Rick is forced to hedge his bets. Pay attention to these rhetorical hedges. They reveal something fundamental about the argument he would rather you didn't notice. For example, where he says mysteriously, we have ways of slowing down the expenditure. He's really talking about slowing down the patrons through quantitative squeezing. <laughs> Decreasing the number of books offered as the money runs out. Well, who selects which records to suppress and which books to hide from the patrons so they can't trigger selections? Under PDA, librarians themselves have to make these choices just as they choose the profiles of records to expose in the first place. But this is precisely collection shaping. What to include and exclude. Knowing that bad things can happen when PDA runs wild, Rick hedges covert by covertly acknowledging that librarian collection shaping is necessary after all. Did you notice the biggest hedge where Rick is forced to argue my side of the debate? Some places maybe, maybe can't go with PDA due to political reasons. Well, what are these mysterious political reasons? Again, it's not that these libraries couldn't do PDA, it's just not politically advisable because bad things can happen when the, that could get the library into trouble. If you overdeploy the screwdriver, someone gets screwed. <laughs> the faculty know this and they exert political pressure to prevent it. So Rick tries to reduce the proposition to a logical zero. Collections should be shaped by PDA, except where they shouldn't. 20 seconds. Finally, Rick ignores the largest fallacy of PDA. It deprives libraries of their primary tool for leveraging limited budgets, coordination. We exist in an interdependent ecosystem of cooperation. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Remember, you don't have to collect everything your patrons need, but you do need to have other libraries out there ready to lend what you can't okay, collect. Okay. The PDA proposal uh, 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 would make uh, 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 coordination uh, 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 uh. Hold it, hold it. Okay. Uh. Thank you. Now, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to suggest two things. One is, could we put up the actual proposition? Is that possible? Because it would be nice if they could see it. Oh, they can't do the voting now, can they? Oh, you can't do that. Anyhow, it's in your, in your program. Now, questions, comments, to either or both, okay? There's Mr. Rintout who didn't actually arrive at the beginning, but it doesn't stop him, but it's very kind of him. <laughs> it's nice to see a publisher speak. Now he's, he's girding his loins, go on. Well, I, I was just so inspired by the debate. Um, it, it seems like the Charleston of yore. Um, so I've got uh, several, <laughs> several points. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm Stephen Rintout from Alexander Street Press. And the points I wanted to make were, um, Firstly, when I look at uh, PDA, it seems to me like it's document-centric. And many, many of the big values that we can provide scholars in the future are actually analytical tools that cut across many, many different documents. So to me, the actual question about serving um, uh, patrons, yeah, of course we want to serve patrons. But if we have, say, a statistical analysis tool I'll use the competitors, say uh, Oxford University Press's uh, Social Explorer database, doesn't really lend itself to PDA. Second point, if I take a look at the underlying usage um, argument, we all of us know that usage can be hugely distorted. Your argument, Rick, to get into it, because I believe David's right, your argument, Rick, is actually that usage is somehow a pure way that patrons actually choose. I've worked for a vendor where words like sex were actually driving usage hugely. 
It's not a direct surrogate. We'd love it to be, but it isn't. Third point, it's about economics, isn't it? We want to serve our patrons. But if you have, for example, at the Alexander Street Press history database, uh, we have 5,000 videos at a buck or two per video. Patron-driven access doesn't work because it's actually less economic. The number of uh, uh, uses that one would get and the price one would have to pay. So I believe the same is true of a number of journal packages. If you analyze the usage, it's actually far better to go with the collection. That's so, a long comment. It was. <laughs> I'm done. Thank you very much. Okay, do either of you gentlemen have anything stunning to say, or are we exhausted by your endeavor? Yeah, I think it's to me. Uh, but they're li people in gold, they're lying down with, people with uh, dusky maidens fanning them. Okay. Wow, that was more than I needed to know about what's happening in gold. Um, so I'll try to remember all three points. So the, the first was that there are some tools that can't, be, that can't be acquired that way that may nevertheless be important tools. And, and like I said, that... that, that reality is built into the resolution. The resolution explicitly recognizes not just that it's not politically feasible, but that it is not always possible to acquire things that we need in, in a PDA program. And that's, and in those situations, we need to acquire, acquire them in some other way. And that's, that's fine. Um, the, the second point was, your second comment was about... Um, the purity of usage. The, the purity of usage as... As, as, as representing... No, no, we, we, yes, you go and sit down. <laughs> okay. so do, I, do, I not, do I not get to answer that? No, I think we have to have somebody else make it. You continue answering it, yeah. But well, he, I needed him to clarify it in order for, no, no, no. <laughs> in order for me to respond. Too, okay, you clarify it, go on. <laughs> <laughs> You've got Dave behind you. Yeah, something about sex. I really... Yeah. <laughs> And then you brought up dusky maidens, and now I'm... So, so what I'm saying is that uh, the assumption, underlying assumption is that usage is somehow pure, that it represents absolutely oh, no. what yeah. patrons want. No, 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 that's, no. That, that, that's not now. the assumption. The assumption, <laughs> the assumption is that usage is a better indicator than guesswork, which is what we traditionally do in libraries. We, we, we are not doing guesswork in terms of quality. We're doing guesswork in terms of actual real-world usefulness. Okay, any comments, uh, Gladiator Omega? Certainly. I'll, I'll just reply briefly to the last one about guesswork. I don't know too many librarians actually doing guesswork. I don't know what guesswork means if you're talking about the absence of actual data or input or information. Usage, of course, is only one piece of information. We know, as I mentioned in my statement, what is being taught, what new courses are being added, which new hires are taking place in our departments, what kind of research trends are going on in these fields. If we wait for those changes to take place before proactively uh, developing our collections to meet those needs, a lot of what those, those programs might require simply won't be available. Don't assume that everything comes through the narrow focus and the narrow beam of patron-driven acquisition. So it's not guesswork, it's highly informed decision-making because we are working with the patrons Contrary to the, you know, the mythical librarian who sits in a corner with a catalog and does blind guesswork about what to select, which is kind of the vision that my opponent has been trying to paint. Okay, so, uh, you know, I, well, I, you go first, and then I'll go up to uh, Colonial Gold, please. Hi. Good morning. I'm Kirsten Dugan from the University of Illinois. Um, I believe it was Mr. Mager who made the comment that frequently uh, some argue PDA collections can lead to vanilla or similar collections. And I want to bring up the point that one of my colleagues often makes about approval plans and subscribing to large packages with lots of content. If all of universities do similar things in that way, then aren't our collections similar? So I would argue that PDA in some ways can actually lead to more unique collections because everybody is studying subjects in different ways. So I'm wondering if you'd comment on that. Well, I think if I understood the question properly, uh, you're talking about uniqueness that, that comes through PDA versus approval plans, is that correct? Yeah, okay, well, yes, uniqueness though within which universe? Remember the point of what's coming through the PDA plans. As I said, it's the things that are the most narrow focus of commercially viable content. It's not the broad scope of things that people actually would use and need if you exposed more to them. But remember, this, it depends on what's available for discovery. And if libraries aren't collecting beyond that narrow, uh, commercially centered content, there's not going to be anything to discover out there. And 
Ebola keeps growing, ISIS keeps spreading, and we're all in trouble. But, but of course, nobody's suggesting that libraries shouldn't collect beyond what's available via PDA. That, 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 that's a, a, an argument that you keep responding to as if somebody's making it, but nobody is. Well, okay. I, I do see in front of me the proposition it says wherever possible. That, that statement is designed to demonstrate or to claim a maximal usefulness of PDA, wherever possible, it means go with it. No, it's, it's, designed, it's designed to define a circle outside of which we recognize PDA doesn't work. Within the circle of what it's possible to collect via PDA, the resolution says we should collect via PDA, recognizing that there is a greater world outside of that circle whereby li librarian-driven collection is still going to have to happen. In other words, you're changing the proposition to library collections should be pay, uh, shaped by patrons except where they shouldn't. Okay, no. I want another question. No, no, uh, it's, uh, it's, quiet, sorry, quiet, no, it's, quiet. Stop. Uh, upstairs, gold. Anybody? I gold. think we're still stuck. No, okay, the dusky colonial? Maidens. <laughs> no? Who have not arrived. <laughs> okay, go ahead, please, Dave. Okay, I'm, I'm Dave Tickison from Cal State Fresno. And I think there's an underlying assumption that you've made here that is a fallacy and that most libraries in this country do not exist to support scholarship. They are public libraries where scholarship is only a very minor component of what they do. And then you can look at community colleges where it's sort of a mostly education, a little scholarship. Even my own institution, which is a you know, master's degree granting is sort of half and half. Yet the argument is that we all need to support the long tail of scholarship. So how does, how does this proposition relate to, to a small public library? It, it doesn't. We've both been arguing in the context of academic libraries. The is that right? The probably should have said academic library collections, but I think both of our statements were clearly yeah. made in the context of, of academic libraries. You were wrong. <laughs> and even, even uh, okay. within academic uh, libraries, even within academic libraries, I, I wouldn't argue that every institution, uh, you know, should not uh, engage in patron-driven acquisition. That was not my point. <laughs> My point is that you do want some libraries out there that are not strictly following this proposition, that are going beyond what they could acquire this way, because whether you're a small community college or, or a, a public, even a public library in a neighborhood where you can borrow materials, um, you want libraries with broader collections out there. If every library- You've made your point. You've made your point. <laughs> Go on. Um, upstairs, anybody? Yes. yes. Uh, Did you hear some colonial? Oh dear. <laughs> okay, well. It sounds like the Gauls have. have I don't know. They sound they bad news. Well, while we're waiting for them to try and come in, I don't know what's gone wrong. <laughs> Sheila, say who you are. Uh, Sheila Coral, University of Pittsburgh. Um, I, I just wanted to make, um, uh, uh, come back to what this. Um, proposition actually says. It doesn't actually say anything about patron-driven acquisition. It says being shaped by patrons instead of by librarians. And I think that, uh, that uh, proposition can apply equally to public libraries. And indeed, I've heard many people argue that very point. And uh, as for saying that uh, materials such as, you know, gray literature or specialized data sets are the sorts of things that uh, cannot be acquired through a patron-shaped model, I think that's complete nonsense, because how would librarians um, be able to identify some of these specialized data sets? And I'm not talking about databases here, I'm talking about highly specialized data sets that faculty would want to use in their research and maybe provide access to their students. I mean, those are the sorts of things that the patron including faculty as well as students, and we shouldn't forget that in the <coughs> academic context, are exactly the people who should be helping librarians to shape the collection, because librarians are unlikely okay. to be able to identify these. Any comments on that? Yes, well, I agree with you that patrons should help librarians shape the collection, but that's not what the proposition says. It says the patrons should shape the collection, and if shaping means actually determining which content gets into the library, um, patrons alone cannot discover uh, and engage in the, and they certainly won't, even if they could, 
find all the things that might be necessary for them to do their work. Not every library can do this, but I know, you know, we have a, 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 a data and statistical services unit where people engaged in quantitative research uh, are doing this kind of work all the time, students and faculty, and they work with the librarians to identify the kind of research query they're undertaking, but the patrons can't really find the data sets themselves. They can't identify and say, get me this piece of data for my research. They rely upon the networking uh, okay. and connections of the librarians okay, to identify we, for them. We'll have to, well, I just want to check. Can Colonial hear? Can you hear us now? Colonial? Can you hear us? Yes. Are you have a, do you have a question? Yes. We'll just last question or comment, okay? Go ahead, say who you are. Rich Goss, University of Central Florida. The idea of uh, no, patrons, there. the PDA as a tool works, but one of the ways for decades we've done PDA is with having a librarian with a liaison with a faculty member in a department. And they provide input for our selection, but the librarian shapes it. Because we all know situations where a faculty member is picking the things that they need for their research, but not the, their colleagues in the department, and you end up with a very narrow focus within that department. Okay, very quickly, responses by the two gladiators. So, so that is certainly a, a problem with patron selection. That's a, problem that, that's a problem with listening to whoever comes to the librarian and says, I need these books, and you don't need to worry about buying those books. Um, that's not a problem with, with patron-driven acquisition programs as they exist, which reflect the work that the, that the faculty members do rather okay, than... Okay, that's, that's, that's one. The other one? Uh, I'm sorry, that's a hedge. That, notice that hedge. Okay, uh, now this is the end. <laughs> sorry, uh, we have to finish now. Voting, voting, and meanwhile, the two gladiators now leave the floor, dragging their chains behind them.